All right, welcome everyone. We are live in Boston, Massachusetts today, and we have had a we've been trying to do some tests before this. Uh, so for anyone that's been online, that's that has uh, delayed us a little bit. But we are trying to get our guest on, and we've switched to a headset to try and deal with some of the feedback issues. Common problem we've had it before with Facebook is getting the feedback uh, with me. Typically, it's not typically with the guest but we get that feedback and, and struggle to pull it together. So we're waiting for him to come on and then we will be talking about cyber defense today. We have a lot to cover. This is an enormous topic area and we need to deal everything from the individual to the national level and then of course, as many of us know, internationally as well. All right, sir, let's see if we can get And hopefully we will have eradicated the problem He's adding, and we're waiting for the connection. And so to keep adding to this uh, conversation, what we're really trying to figure out is, is what we need to do to be able to set up. Oh, had a bit of an issue. He's not coming on. All right, Jim, go ahead and give it a try and see if you can uh, access me. It's not giving me an option to access you. See if you can request. Should be a picture in picture down at the bottom. And you can ask to add me to the conversation. Well, we will try one more time. No, I am not getting access. Can you try and text him and see if he's able to uh, request to join? There are two different ways that you can get onto a Facebook Live. One is to have, there we go, that should work. There we go, all right. So sometimes we run into some technical difficulties. No worries. Hey, no. Nope, it's nope. still it's feedback. Still feedback. Do you have a headset? Do you have a headset? Uh, yeah, but I'm gonna have to go old school that at that point. <laughs> you might win. You might win the award. This is the hardest we we've had. We've had. <laughs> I'll try to stand really still. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Well, we are we are live today. I was just telling everyone we're live from Boston today, but you are actually located in Colorado. Ingl You're in Colorado. Colorado. Okay, very good. So we, we are spanning the nation, which is incredibly cool uh, that we can do videos like this. But as we've learned, there are also technical difficulties that come into play. And, and that's, yeah, we solve one problem, we create another. So, Jim, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'm going to let you give your spiel uh, because I, I know you have a, a long and varied set of experiences. Um, but go ahead and share those. Yeah, the gray it, hair is real, unfortunately. <laughs> at this point, so, it's... so share with us kind of your background and what it is that most recently uh, has put you into the position you're in in your company and, and where it is that you see this nation going. So that, that's a lot to cover. Sure, not a problem. Um, so myself, as well as the uh, founders of Direct Defense, we all come from a pretty varied background dealing with cybersecurity. Uh, myself specifically, I've been doing this, let's see, uh, I turned 18 in 1989, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> so pretty much a long, long checkered path before it was an actual industry to the point it actually yeah. cybersecurity becoming an industry in the you know, early 90s, the, the heyday of the dot-com market. And, really working on cybersecurity research, so actually identifying vulnerabilities, uh, penetration testing, so the offensive side of security, so people pay us to break in, or if you're a movie buff, the old school like sneakers and you know war games movies from back in the day. Um, until most recently, really when we started Direct Defense, we started again with our background of being on the offensive side, but our customer base really started asking for more and more assistance uh, helping with the defensive side. And that's been, you know, the, the ongoing challenge for many years is, you know, our, our path to glory on the offensive side is we just have to get it right once. And, you know, our customers have to get uh -huh. it right every time. And so there's 
you know, for myself, as well as being kind of a history buff, as well as a, you know, philosophy buff of understanding how societally we got here, how decisions were made, business decisions were made, personal decisions were made, to the challenges that people face day to day on the cybersecurity front. And so we offer defensive services or managed security services where we're monitoring the security for folks and helping them identify when they're getting attacked. And then most importantly, as of recently, uh, myself as well as your colleague on the other side of the room there, uh, have been working quite a bit with uh, forensics. So unfortunately, when, when someone has a bad day, you know, cue the, Ameri you know, the uh, American <laughs> Idol, uh, you know, so you have that day <laughs> song. But uh, uh, when, they, when they get to a, a suffer a breach or suffer a ransomware event, which has really been prevalent in the last few months, both at a national but also at a state and city level, municipality level across the entire country, you know, that's something we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, not only from the being the supportive role, hand-holding, getting them through the process, but also kind of analyzing how we got here, you know, what happened along the way and, and going from there. So, you know, Direct Defense is a company. We really uh, work with customers in a wide variety of backgrounds and verticals or industries, if you will, from the, the more regulated, like the financial sector, to manufacturing, to hospital and healthcare, to just, you know, the this, this startup MSP, startup mom and pop organization. Um, so we, we have pretty pretty wide breadth of uh, experience at this point. And as I, I still make the joke of, you know, the gray hair is real. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so I want to pick up on one of the points you just made, which is you cover all of these different industries. So one of the things that we see, um, particularly in politics or in what I focus on, which is national readiness, is mm -hmm. content areas, right? So you're focused on fixing the environment or fixing healthcare or fixing this. But cyber defense, cyber security, or cyber offense, depending on right. which direction we're talking about, uh, really spans all of these issues because it, it, it right. gets to the point of how data moves. And yeah. if I were to summarize my understanding of how most people feel, certainly not to include the people in your field, but, but most of us feel like we're moving into a new space that's really quite scary because we can't see enemies coming. We it isn't limited to defense organizations. Um, it's happening to Americans individually and in their day-to-day -day lives. And so I, I, I think it's, it's kind of put people on edge because they don't know where they're looking or what to be afraid of. And, and, and almost this boogeyman concept, uh, I, I think, does start to haunt some people. So the reaction, of course, is say, I don't want any part of any of it. And unfortunately or fortunately, depending on which way you want to look at it, we are moving into the digital space. There is no getting around this. Correct. You can like it, you can dislike it, but I often say you have two choices. You can enter into the digital age safely and securely by us making plans, or we can let it happen to us. Correct. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a very true statement. And, and <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I've had the you know, fortunate uh, opportunity to actually kind of see this become an industry, as I was alluding to earlier, of the the early days of the dot coms, knowing they should be doing something to societally, uh, now we're in the land of compliance or you're obligated to be doing something. So, yeah. you know, cybersecurity is a cost of doing business, but more importantly, it's a cost of understanding, you know, who's using your data, who's accessing your data. And, you know, as you've seen in your past life, uh, you know, from the OPM breach to, you know, yeah. other, uh, you know, the more common the things that people saw with like the, you know, the, uh, uh, was it the Experian um, uh, or uh, not Experian, but uh, Equifax? Yes. Um, you know, those type of breaches to where, um, you know, it's it's not you, it's the person you do business with that has resold your data. And so that's out of our, you know, colleagues, international colleagues over in the EU, they came up with their own data security standard and it's forthcoming here in the United States. It's just a matter of someone actually putting a stake in the ground and saying, well, sorry, businesses, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to actually acknowledge what, you're, what you plan to do with this data and how you plan to use it in your economy of subsystems. So. so tell us about that. I, I'm familiar with it, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that most people are not familiar with that policy. So, sure. so yeah. So uh, data has always really had three states for many, many years. That was in process, in transit, and at rest. And when we talk about compliancy like credit cards or just the transactional things you do on the internet like surfing all day, you know, what that really guarantees or what you're having to deal with is security based on industry, based on specific requirements, that you are taking care of a customer's data when they fill out a form on the page, and that's, that's in process. In transits, when you press the submit button as it goes from point A to point B, and then finally it rests once it's done processing that data and stores your data in a, in a digital storage format, you know, aka, you know, it, you know, if you're using the Amazon analogy, it takes your order and then processes it. <laughs> 
um, what GDPR uh, brought into. Um, oh, just to be clear, GDPR is general. It's general data um, protection uh, protection requirements, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and so essentially, what that established for international or you know European Union citizens was oh, yeah. upfront. You had to actually explain um, as a corporation what I was planning to do with the EU citizens' data that they submitted to us. Um, and secondarily is I now had to guarantee a fourth state of data, and that is death or destruction. And so, you know, how do you actually delete my data when I tell you to delete my data throughout your entire subsystems and all the places you've, you know, resold, redone my data? And that's, that's a bigger challenge than a lot of companies were facing last year because the yeah. Enforcement date started uh, you know, was it May of last year. Yes. And so it was a lot of catch up to figure out as an American company, what am I obligated to and, and so forth and so on. And so, you know, what the American citizenry is looking for is, all right, great, when's it our turn? Where are we going to have the standard? When, when are these, you know, requirements to do business going to come into place? And so that's kind of the general discussion at a, at a, at a national level uh, that's going on right now when we talk about just data and the life cycle of data. Yeah, so I'll add to that a little bit because we, we had a lot of training in it when we were overseas at NATO. And so I was in Switzerland when this hit and when it was getting uh, ramped up. And so we had a, a number of experts come in and share with all of our EU uh, constituents, but also with us uh, in the US DOD. And we just kept asking ourselves, why are we not adopting the same? Especially because what I think a lot of people don't realize is that so many of these American companies are having to adopt this anyway. So it's not like it's Correct. adding to their, to their um, uh, struggles or cost or anything like that. It, it, they, they've already built out the infrastructure to be able to be compliant. Uh, it, is, it is only going to affect those that are completely U.S. only focused. Uh, right. And that's starting to get more and more and more rare. Anybody who's doing work online is happy to take a customer from anywhere. So. <laughs> As long as, least figure out how to ship it. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you figure yeah. out how to ship it there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very, it's a very, rather small number that would be affected by it, truly changing it. Uh, and so it became one of those questions that we started asking, why, why is this not getting more buzz? And, and certainly my understanding on the inside is that there is a struggle to understand what the ripple effect of putting policy in place like this mm -hmm. has. And we also have a generational divide. And then in our country, and particularly, in, we have a uh, political divide. So the EU system is very different than our system, and it allows them to make some decisions in ways differently than we can. Um, but what would you say are some of the benefits of GDPR, and, and what are some of the things that maybe particularly for our country might be problematic, if um, any? So, yeah, oh, um, honestly, it's the cost of doing business. So it's yet another you know, barrier that an organization is going to have to deal with when going to market with their technology or their platform, their solution, whatever it may be. So there is an adherent cost that has to be paid for. And unfortunately, that's going to come down to the consumer, whether you like it or lump it. You know, just, yeah. it's, it's, someone's going to have to pay for all this effort. But the biggest benefit is the fact that organizations have struggled historically across time uh, to understand what they do. How do they derive money? How do they, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times we've had executive C-suite conversations that this is the fourth or fifth, you know, new board or new folks in there, and they're still struggling, you know, in the first 30 days, they're still struggling to figure out how the company actually makes money. Wow. Um, and so with <laughs> that, if you take that step back of, well, okay, you make money by this way, and then more importantly, this compliancy stuff really doesn't apply or it does apply, and you know, when we talk about, you know, the concept of, you know, data life cycle, it's you now are obligated to actually understand what your data is, yeah. where it's stored at, how is it used in all the various systems, and make sure you have an accounting and the visibility throughout that entire life cycle. And so there are some technical controls, but mostly it's policy procedure and understanding, you know, people, people, in, play, you know, people in procedures before you get the technology. Um, and that's, you know, as we all know at this point in time in this industry, especially in cybersecurity, there's a a national deficiency in talent, um, Very much just available, so. available people applying for jobs. So that is also another factor contributing to the challenge of you know, how successful will we be in the future. Yeah, one of the things that we talk about is uh, educating our young people. And um, certainly China is well ahead of us in this area than we are. Yeah, I won't limit to just their old people we, or young people. We've got, a whole <laughs> gen, you know, we've got several generations that have never, under, never even got ta taught how to use email correctly. 
Well, so true. I would actually, yeah. I would, I would say we actually need to start with the existing workforce and then work down, <laughs> or right. vice versa, whichever direction you want to start at. But yeah, that's this is a national starting point when it comes to the education of cybersecurity. So, so if so, if you were to lay out, so one of the things that we've been talking about doing is laying out national strategies. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, they don't understand why we, we, actually, I don't think most people know that we even have national strategies in the government, but that is actually the job of the president is to write with a team of people, of course, what the strategy is going to be for the next five to 20 years. Sure. And we usually have a management agenda, which oversees how uh, all the people in the executive branch are going to operate. We have a defense strategy, which talks about how we're going to, it, it's not how we're going to fight a war. It is how we're going to set up our talent management and how it is that we are going to uh, manage the services in the Pentagon to be able to be at readiness. So what we're trying to do is look at this in uh, different areas as well. So we just finished one in environment, but I've been saying, what is it that we would put into a national cyber strategy? And I think the knee-jerk reaction is to think about, okay, what are the rules and regulations we would put in place? That would be like a GDRP concept, right? It would be a policy. But sure. actually, there's a whole lot more to this because the strategy is supposed to be about getting all of our people ready and able to handle all of the threats, whether they be at the individual personal level or at the national s scale. Either way, empowering people to react. So your point of we need to teach people how to use email correctly, it strikes me because then I think, well, surely most people know how to use email. And I would suspect mm -hmm. everyone would say, almost everyone would say, yes, I know how to use email. But my suspicion is that when you use the word correctly, there's more to it. Right. And then that opens the door to a major piece of a strategy like this would likely need to involve education for everyone, whether you are school aged or, or 75 or older, we need to make sure everybody's empowered because there's a ripple effect, is there not? Correct, very much so. And that's kind of going to you know, the life cycle of an email. You know, there's, you know, at the very least, there's two sides of that, which is sending and receiving. Um, when you receive the email, which is the most common problem we run into day to day, especially when we hear about, you know, random company got broken into compromise. Right. It was because of a phishing email or you know an email soliciting either you know download this, run this, or give me your password. Um, and sometimes they're that transparent. Um, but it's again about social awareness of actually teaching folks this not only not only the common tricks that we all take advantage of because as a penetration tester I use them and abuse them all day long. <laughs> Um, and so if you take that out of the equation of on the offensive side, just general awareness. You know, as a society, we are pretty quick on, you know, oh, we, you know, we need to understand, you know, my data is private, my data is private. And I'm like, right, then why'd you get it out, give it out for free? Right. Um, and so there's some obligation, a personal obligation to actually understand what you're giving away or what's, what's the value of that. And, you know, you'd be surprised sometimes we find monetary theft on all types of things. My, one of my favorite ones of all time was a, a brand that was relaunching, and um, their product is fairly inexpensive, and so they relaunched with this new you know, rebranding um, a coupon, and they had a game, and unfortunately that game was compromised in a, in a matter of minutes by the bad guys, and I found out there was a whole economy of couponware guys, and so basically what they were doing was playing this game and spinning off literally millions of these $5 coupons and then selling them on eBay for a dollar. So, you know, it took them a matter of minutes to generate, you know, literally, you know, selling it for a dollar generated a million. They just generated a million dollars with these little $5 coupons. So wow. it's, it's that type of thing. If, if there is a monetary value, there's someone willing to go after it. And, you know, that expectation of are you as diligently trying to protect your data as the guy that's trying to steal it? In most cases, no, we're kind of oblivious and we don't know. And so it's, you're going to have to take a little personal responsibility on that side of it. Nationally, yeah, I mean, that's a bigger uh, question because it's very broad. Um, we have a lot of, you know, if I, I'm, I'm a big infrastructure buff, so we have a lot of antiquated stuff out there for our, court, yeah. our, our, our national infrastructure that just is woefully out of date. And with that in mind, it's, you know, how do you take something that was built in the 40s, 50s, 60s, if you're lucky, 70s, and put it into the modern era, um, that is, nine out of 10, it's controlled by a private company. You're going to go back and tell that company that, no, you can't do business this way. Good luck. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> so with that, you know, if it's a privatized you know, environment, you can only dictate so much. There is the reality of you know, where we're, we're dealing with. And you know, in, the, in the critical infrastructure, that's where we get into the, you know, the, the energy standards and 
you know, utility standards they have to abide by. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very broad question. Um, and, a, you know, honestly, it's not a simplistic answer. But, yeah. No. You know, first part is start at home. Start to, you know, I, I'm a father. I have a teenager. Well, now a 21-year-old and a <laughs> teenager. We're um, almost so, there. I almost yeah. have a 21-year-old. <laughs> I've got a few more months. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, that first beer, you know. Hey. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, just teaching them when they were growing up what they should and should not divulge about themselves online to, you know, from there, you know, they learn that and then learn their social interactions and so forth. And we have a chance now with, you know, the, your, your, your youngest one in there to actually have that, you know, complete life cycle of being online and having an yeah. you know, online experience. And so making sure she's well armed and prepared. Uh, I know you guys will do your job on that side. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I mean, you, you know, try, it, but it's yeah. hard. I mean, parents, you know, we don't know. I, I, even me having to learn all this social media stuff, I, I, I work at a really <laughs> high level and I, I don't know all of the social media stuff and had had to learn all of the pieces, parts to it. Um, sure. I was intentionally never on Facebook prior to, to trying to get out and do this. But I also recognize the utility that we have to. Um, yeah. But trying to check yourself, check your kids, check your work. I mean, it, it becomes overwhelming. When is it that, uh, you know, and what trouble am I in if I'm, at a, if I'm at a local coffee shop? Sure. You know, am yeah. I... <laughs> Yeah, I was Am going I to go, opening yeah. up to everything? Yeah. Yeah, kind of. I mean, and then <laughs> on top of that, you know, how do we know it's, you know, AT&T or T-Mobile Wi-Fi? Uh, you know, but at the same time, you know, like um, even in, in the workplace, you know, we deal with this a lot, especially when the novelty of this platform, Facebook, was first around, um, and now social media is here to stay. It's not going away. No. Um, just working with organizations to educate their workforce of, you know, when is it okay to say, I work for ABC Corp? Well, that's pretty common. You can go ahead and do that. That's not a problem. Yeah. We like to have our employees talk about how, where they work and how they like it. Um, is it okay to actually divulge that you're a, you know, a, a program manager on the next technology that's going to set up this entire company? Maybe, yeah. maybe not. And then more importantly, I'm working on Project Viper, uh, which is the, you know, the, the technology they've already alluded to that's going to be their, their benchmark moving forward. It's like, no, you, just be, you, know, you as an individual just made yourself a target for industrial espionage and what have you, and we get to, you know, divulging that much information about yourself. And so it's just, you know, doing work seminars with organizations, like, when's it okay to talk about your work and how far do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, and then on the other hand, if you don't share, then we struggle to connect and be able to work forward as well. Exactly. Um, so certainly I've run into that problem, right, where people yeah, will talk to me. Especially in past life, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. You'll talk to people um, and they'll talk to you offline, but getting people to talk on camera can be challenging for reasonable reasons. And yet at the yeah. same time, um, I often say if we, if we want to make things better, or we want to change something, we also do have to come and, and share. And so finding that line can be, it, it's just a real struggle. And I think predominantly because people don't know, right? So when I was in government, we would actually get from Office of General Counsel uh, clarification on rules. And partly what they were actually trying to do was encourage us to work with businesses, not discourage us, which mm -hmm. surprised a lot of people. But what they found was that when people were unsure what the rules are, they said, we won't touch anything. We won't talk to anyone. Right. And what that did for defense meant we were then losing out on access to capabilities. And it doesn't mean that we were trying to take a capability from a company. But when you don't even know it exists or that right. it's coming, then that means your adversary does. <laughs> yeah. And so they said, wait a minute here. We need to help our government workers not be so afraid to work with others and not be so afraid to share information uh, that they just close the door. And so finding that balance is, is not just challenging. It actually has some very tangible, real ripple effects um, yeah. and impacts to the country and to individuals. So I, I think the struggle is where do people start getting information on how to do this? It's, it's oftentimes very technical people who work in technical jobs who talk to technical people. How yeah. do we find the translation? Um, well, honestly, it's got to be all about dialogue at the end of the day. And, you know, yeah. uh, someone, if you go to the, you know, let's say my side of the, of, of the fence of asking us to slow down and explain that, better, <laughs> <laughs> then we find someone that actually, we, we, define, we need to find that translator. And uh, myself, as well as my, uh, you know, colleagues, every day we, we work with trying to find 
you know, we come up with some, some of the most elegant ways and we high five ourselves and pat ourselves on the back on a <laughs> broken to XYZ platform. And then you walk into the executive board meeting and the CEO of the company's like, oh, that was nice. So how much is it going to cost me to fix this problem? Yeah. And so you got to, you know, take your hacker hat off, put your business hat back on and, you know, explain, okay, well, here's the impact or here's the way you, you know, you spend this in the market space if you need to market proactively against this problem. And, uh, really just educate. So, yeah, I mean, the first step is, you know, ask a hacker. We're, we're, we're pretty verbose. We'll tell you what's going on. Like, well, that um, needs to be a T-shirt, ask a hacker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, there'll be one in Vegas very shortly. So, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, for those that aren't in this industry, uh, yeah. the annual hacker convention is coming up in Las Vegas the, the, what, the week of the uh, 5th uh, of August. So, yeah, Black Hat and DEF CON are the big annual uh, conventions. So, yeah. So come on out. <laughs> we can talk to all the I don't hackers. know. I don't know if everyone yeah. would understand everything that yeah. was happening, but uh, it's a good. Uh, it's a good shot. So you know, the, the NSA will definitely be there. So if you yes. want to talk to the government person. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, there's a lot happening in government in this space, right? We yeah. we are working on the national digital strategy. Uh, we have a number of groups that are trying to work in this area. I know in, in my particular program, we were looking at tendencies of people. Right? So it's not just, uh, and you've alluded to it earlier, it's not just someone has your data or doesn't have your data. Additionally, it's do you know when you've put the correct um, uh, safety markers or, or, or pulled the safety levers as you need to and put them in place? And so what we found was that you actually had to kind of coach people through it and say, right. Hey, you, you, you are somebody who is going to the cafe a lot. You probably need to have X in place, even though you haven't thought about it because your friend hasn't or because you haven't read it in a manual. And so it got into right. kind of this psychological training as much as um, just regular education on how things work, but rather why and when you should be using them. Um, and yeah, it was in, in getting into also designing systems so that it gives that prompt. Right, recognizing that, that people do not right. think of these things. Um, most of us are busy, and unless we have a business that we're trying to protect, mm -hmm. we often think, well, we're good people. We don't have a lot of information someone wants to steal. Um, but they can, they can take some very interesting uh, tidbits that, that seem small, like you said, a $5 yeah. coupon. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem like a big deal until you multiply it by a million. Right, yeah, and then someone's making money out of the scenario. And yeah, it's just... Uh, really, you know, at the end of the day, I keep coming back to education, and it's really, you know, it, there's it, it time. It's it's now time to be a national dialogue about from yeah, you know, infancy. You know, we we now have generations. You know, I actually use my daughter, my youngest daughter, who's about you know, about to be sixteen in three days. Uh, and so yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, a you know, good challenging no pressure, age. No pressure. <laughs> Uh, but uh, more importantly, you know, she was, uh, her generation was truly one of the first generations that had yeah. a digital marker from birth to her ultimate, you know, when she does expire in her life cycle. Um, and so there has to be an accounting from, you know, not only the government side of that, but also business yeah. societal side of how we deal with all this data that we're generating and, and go from there. And, um, you know, it's, I've been lucky, if you will, to kind of see most recently a lot more on the deal. Really just kind of go from that aspect into um, dealing with um, um, the offensive side as well and seeing how that has changed dramatically in the last you know 15 years yeah. and, you know there's been some you know fairly interesting documentaries that you can look up out there about that but uh, you know it's what's it, your favorite it, yeah. um honestly the uh, zero day I, I think uh, zero Gen day. Okay. general Michael general Michaels uh, actually presented himself very well in that one you know, it's you know, we, we all know he was around during that time we can make our own <laughs> illusions but you know at the same time of you know it's it needs to be a national dialogue on you know we have yeah. established a fourth we have established a fourth form of warfare and yes you know, candidly this this version has far more long-term damage than the kinetic method of warfare yes. uh so with that in mind it's like you know you know, you know kind of needs to be a dialogue you know it took 20 30 years to get the uh, policy around nuclear and biological warfare start need to have the dialogue around cyber and i i'm sorry to say there is not anywhere near as much dialogue as there should be i don't it, i know for a fact it's not on anybody's platform um, so this is not even a political issue from a perspective that it's one side or the other side. It's right. a national readiness and capability issue. And um, it, it, I, I hope we protect it from the political back and forth because it just needs to be addressed. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, we can say, well, regulation, not regulation. 
the no, reality. It's, it's got to be a dialogue first. We, we're not ready for regulation. Yes, we just need to no. say yes, yeah. no, maybe. Yeah. Well, in defense, we need some parameters at the least, right? right. And, and mm -hmm. what we're running into is, I mean, you alluded to old, old systems, archaic systems, right? Well, mm -hmm. we have the same problem. And yeah. so <laughs> uh, while the company that built X thing uh, is not owning it any longer, in order for us to get them to fix it or upgrade it, well, they get to demand that amount of money because of it is, yeah. yeah. And so changing, changing policy to recognize that we need to be able to fluidly evolve all of our technology into the future actually so. requires, yeah, it requires us to change the entire way, way we do policy. And that's a very foreign concept to a lot of folks that have either been in uh, the congressional side of policy for a long time or who are in politics because this, this doesn't fall in that space at all. This is about um, how to make sure systems can talk to each other and continue to do so into the future, but with safety and security attached. <laughs> right. Oh, well, and, and more importantly, you know, for, uh, most recently, both myself and Chris can allude to the struggles of working with municipalities that yeah. unfortunately are still stuck in either a state run or a federal run purchasing process. Yes that is still using at this point in time when we, when we talk about you know, the, the content of the technology is called endpoint protection or as everybody knows right. it is anti-malware yeah. and they're stuck they're stuck buying solutions that fairly are inadequate um, yes. that vendor has not kept up with the times and you know how do we enable you know from a policy standpoint of how do we get new vendors with better technology into the market space faster and more importantly in use for not only the government but also the state and city municipalities Exactly. Um, and to give you a very quick answer on that, that's actually been mm -hmm. piloted um, in Orlando as well as a number of other locations. And what we're doing is actually looking at rapid turnaround uh, and also changing the way the contracts are written so that they yeah. are not, lo not exactly deliverables per se, uh, because when you have a deliverable, it's a finite stop, but right. that it's actually a service and that it can continue and that people have to use open source, but also that it has this rapid funding cycle. And then what they do is, in our case in Orlando, we were testing moving it through all branches of military so mm -hmm. that no one group was separated. So there are some things that are happening to be able to test out these concepts, which are widely used in business, uh, in right. private industry. But in the public sector, they come with extra challenges. And I know a lot of people, they blanketly say, well, there's so much bureaucracy, it can't ever be fixed. There is a lot of bureaucracy. There are reasons why there is bureaucracy. The right answer is to balance it. <laughs> right. Yep. But if you don't know what the actual problems are, then you just add rules. And that's where we end up with continued you know, elongation of the exact same problem. Yeah. So it's, no. uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but for folks who've never worked in either of these industries, it becomes very interesting because the right answer is how do you, or the right question is how do you fix that? Is there exactly. any way to fix it? And if the answer to both of those is yes, then we actually have a chance. And that, right. that I'm excited to say, I do believe exists. It just doesn't always make it up to you know, the news, it's not, it's not a sexy topic. <laughs> yeah, well, very, very much so. But you know, I, I guess the best test case you can, you, you guys can actually use right now is the OPM compromise. Uh, and you know, it's a great example of when purchasing decisions were hampered to the yeah. detriment of being able to be successful. So yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we could line up a lot of examples. <laughs> yeah. One that made the news, but I might be able to add a few more. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I can, we can share those too, but yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> Maybe offline, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so to close out, what would be one piece of advice that you would want to give? Actually, I, I'll, I'll phrase it this way, that you would want to give the government, because I think we've already touched that education is something that we really need to make pervasive. But right. if there was one more layer to it, what would be the, be the one additional talking point that we should focus on? Um, again, it comes back to with the changes in society today, it's going to be a national conversation around the life cycle of data, um, you know, from its creation to its use to its termination. Um, that is directly impacting our economy, our infrastructure, how the government does business, how we do business as private citizens. Yeah. And using platforms like social media today that we need to have plans on what to do with it. What is it going to be classified as? And then from there, more importantly, how do we take care of it as a long-term standard, you know, with the, 
not the current administration, the previous administration did kind of open some can of worms when it talks when we talk about the you know the, in the healthcare industry that people yeah. are now going to have to store data for twenty six years. So it's you know it's those type of things of you know, not only six years to to take care of you, but long term, how do we you know create that national data medical database? And you know you're talking twenty plus years, twenty six yeah. years, even longer depending on who you're, which group you're talking to, and so data has to be forefront on what it is, how it's consumed, how it's used, and how it's you know put away. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This is, a, this is an awesome conversation, <laughs> but I, I feel sure. like we need to continue it. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Jim. And yeah, thank you everyone watching. Bye-bye. Have, have a happy fourth tomorrow. <laughs> you too.